All right, finally, if um, people could help out by typing the names of the mushrooms that we're talking about into the chat, that will help everyone follow along. So who would like to go first? Dave, did you say you actually have to, you have to cut out? No, that's, I, I'm, I can stay for the whole thing. Thanks okay. for asking. Okay, cool. Then um, why don't you go ahead, Penny, since you've uh, volunteered here to break the ice and then I can go into the emails and we'll go in the order that I got them. All right. Let's see. Oh, it says participants can now see your screen. So um, I found this this mushroom on um, my raised bed in our community garden. Um, and uh, I didn't know where to look it up because um, Oops, most of the, um, the shelf fungi, well, it has gills. I didn't get a spore print out of it. I looked under um, the website of um, messiah.edu, which has wood rotting fungi, but I didn't really couldn't get anywhere. So I would appreciate anyone's comments. I bet the wood, uh, the Messiah probably tricked you because you were probably looking for a guild fungi, right? Yes. And they probably considered these pores. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Marisol just put the ID in there. It's called Gloeophyllum sepiarum <clears throat> or something like that. Okay. Hey, cool. All right. Well, that's a good thing to know. Um, the, these would be called pores because they obviously have a different structure is that it um yeah i guess they kind of like they call them like elongated pores if you zoom in on it you can kind of see how they're they're somewhat poroid the pores have been like stretched out really long okay oops well it's not very focused no but you can kind of see that there yeah i mean okay. i would agree. i would i would agree that would be tough to you know if you if somebody didn't tell you that that would be a tough thing to decide on your own yeah, there's always little tricks that are important to know okay good um let's see so Mar marisol did type that in for you all right well, let's see how do i get to my next one did, did i stop sharing my screen no we can still see your screen okay okay this one uh, found in um, a, a Christmas tree farm, and uh, this was growing in groups in, in uh, where the um, bottom of the stipes were not fused, but sometimes edges of the caps were fused, and it had a brown spore print. Um, so I don't know. Oh, um, I'm not really good at guild mushrooms. <laughs> I think it's a hebeloma. Okay. Well, so you knew that because of the brown spore print? Well, it could be a quaternarius also, but it looks more like a hebeloma. And very, very late in the season, um, oh. it's, oh, it's no. not unusual to find hebeloma mushrooms under um, conifer trees on lawns and that's a okay typical habitat now the spore print color for quaternarius is usually kind of a rusty brown and the spore print color for hebeloma is usually more of a muted uh, uh light brown sort of yeah this is kind of, this was kind of a uh light brown okay look on the look on the apex of a stalk 
and see if there's little like flakes or granules up there. I don't see any on that one. That's not always something you see on Hebrew. Oh wait, yeah, yeah. Look on the on the left. Yeah, look coming down the left side of the stock in the middle. No, the middle stock. But oh, right the there, you mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, and up on the upper part too, you can see it's a little flaky. Flaky. On the right, on the right too. It's just the head-on middle part of the stock. I think is reflecting too much light. Okay. So you can't, you can't see the ornamentation. You can see it on the right also. There's a little bit of ornamentation. Yeah, okay. I'd, say, I'd say these are hebeloma. Now, if you use a microscope and you know how to look for cystidium, um, hebeloma will usually have chylocystidia, cystidia on, on the gills. And they're usually pretty long and, and, and they look a little bit like basidia usually, but they're kind of elongated. And um, um, a little more tapered, maybe, or sometimes sometimes they'll have a head on them. Um, and there's a lot of them usually on the edge of the gill. And um, Cortinarius mushrooms, most of them, um, if they do have any chylocystidia, they're very small and they're buried in in the other uh, between the basidia, so you don't really they're hard to see. Um, but that's you know also. Um, actually, quaternarius spores and hebloma spores are a little bit different, usually. Um, so if you can look at spores. Uh, I, I hope to get into that next year. Yeah. That's a New yeah. Year's resolution for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, yeah, what well, would... if you can, you know, they, usually the hebloma spores look like uh, big um, asymmetric um, almonds, sort of. Um, okay, so I think would, these are hebeloma. Would you say that the gills are attached, like? Yeah, they're to, they're adnate with the current. Tooth. Adnate. Uh, adnate. Well, the one on the left is clearly adnate, but you know what? The one on the right, it looks like they're a little bit adnexed, or you know what? They might be seceding. Sometimes gills that are attached break away from the stalk. And they call that seceding. And yeah, so these almost, were a little dried, uh, dried out, and the spore print. You know, they didn't get a whole lot of spores out of it. So, yeah, a light colored, a very light spore print too it can be difficult to correctly assess the color. But okay. clearly, you know, you knew these were brown. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but in in terms of like whether it's a vivid rusty brown or a muted brown. A thin print might be hard to assess, but you know what? I don't. Some some hebeloma mushrooms have a cortina, like cortinarias, um, that and some of it will collapse on the stalk. This one looks like it probably didn't have a cortina. Um, I don't see anything on the stalk to suggest that. Oops. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see any on any of the yeah. looked at. Yeah. It, it's a hebeloma mushrooms are pretty common late in the year and a lot of times under conifers in grassy areas thank you very much you're welcome i was just reading because I, I wasn't sure where hebelomas were i wanted to see if they were at all closely related to cornaris which they don't look like they are they're in the family hymenogastraceae which include things like gallerina Flamulina, but also like psilocybe. And wow, I mean, that's a pretty diverse family. Yeah, isn't it? Flamulina is in there. Oh, I'm sorry, flamula. I'm sorry, flamula. Yeah, flamula. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a split off from foliotis. Foliotis, foliotis in the Strophariaceae. Yeah, they're not in there. There is such a thing anymore. <laughs> Phaeocolibia is in there. Phaeocolibia. Yeah, not common around here. Aren't they the things with all those little spikies off the... Uh... Oh, wait, Phaeocolibia. Um, wait, you know what? No, that's Phaeomerasmius. No. no, they're not. They're decent. Yeah, that's, and that, most of those are now um, Flamulaster, I believe. Hmm. They're little. They're small, and they have, like, really spiky spines. Yeah, that's not what I'm, that's not what spiky, I'm talking Spiky um, scales on the cap. And, and the cap margin usually has, like, little triangular appendic appendiculate stuff that's that's flamulaster arenacilis or arenacilla 
uh, I forget if it's a boy or a girl. Um, you know, I just can't tell the difference with these mushrooms. But anyway. Um, yeah, but so, anyway, yeah, ga yeah, Gallerina, Evoluma, ga you know, Psilocybe, they're all in the same family. Yeah. And a bunch of other yeah. ones I've never heard of. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I never heard of that family. What's that family? <clears throat> Hymeno um, Hymenogastraceae. I'll oh, type wow. it in. I'll type it since I'm probably butchering wow. the name. Huh. I wonder if that's a split off from, from a bigger family. Hmm. There you go. That's the name of it. It means youth and a fringe pertaining to the fungal veil. What does? Uh, the, the Latin uh, name Hymenogastraceae. Uh, um, yeah, not all of the mushrooms. The, the, in the fungal veil is only seen in immature specimens, it says. Yeah, well, and in some, some cases, there is no veil at all for some of the mushrooms that, were, that are in that, um, those genera. Uh, but most of them do have a veil, but some of the Hebaloma don't have partial veil. Um, I think Hebaloma crustulinif, crustuliniformi, <laughs> that's the way you say it. Uh, the Hebaloma that's in most field guides does not have a partial veil, I'm pretty sure. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Penny. Some of the thank gallerinas you. don't have partial veil also. Brandon, do you want to try to identify your Hypholoma? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. And let's see. So start with this kind of cap shot. You can see they're pretty, pretty red. And I have to share one photo at a time. So bear with me. The thing that really gives me pause though, the gills kind of look a little yellow. So I was wondering if you guys have any opinions. Well, the, the, the reddish caps, brick red cap is, you know, sort of points toward Hyphloma lateridium, but uh, if the gills are yellowish, um, that might, Fasciculare is in play. No, nah, I'd say these don't look like fasciculare. Um, maybe capnoides. Those those can be a little bit yellow in the in the gills. Oh, okay. Let's see. Let's what see. kind of wood was it on? Do you know? Uh, it was an oak. It was the roots of an oak. Uh, it's probably lateridium. Look at all that pine needles uh, around in that one picture. Are you sure it was yeah. that oak? Uh, yes, I am, because I followed the root, literally, like, dug it back to a big old oak tree. Okay. The other thing that I'm leaning toward, uh, lateridium, is because of this kind of brown at the bottom of the stipe here. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I that I'm not sure how important that is. They're big. To, how big are they? Pretty good. I mean, not tiny little mushrooms. Every time I've found uh, sulfur tufts, the fasciculare that I know are bright yellow gills, bright yellow cap, um, they're always a lot smaller than these were. Yeah, that's why I asked. Those are usually small. You but know, I if just, you I... taste it, if you taste it, fasciculare is supposed to be bitter and astringent. You can just right. taste it and spit it out. It's like it's not like a death cap or anything. It's you know, right. Yeah, I gave some of it. I, I gave it a, a little bit of a test, and I didn't taste anything. So I was pretty sure that these are lateridium, but you know, they look like lateridium to me. Cool. Lateridium and capnoides can look a lot alike, and capnoides can look a little bit like fasciculare sometimes too. So capnoides is kind of the interesting one. It kind of 
the morphology kind of straddles um, both uh, lateridium and fasciculare. Um, but usually lateridium and fasciculare are pretty easy to tell apart. Yeah, just some of the pictures that I saw, like Michael Quo has a photo of um, fasciculare that is very red. I mean, it doesn't spread as much to the margin, but it, it does have a lot of red in the cap, at least. In, yeah, in the middle of the cap, probably, in, right? Exactly, yeah. So I feel like the red in the caps of these stretch pretty far out to the margin, leading yeah, I would, I would say, that, yeah, that's a character that seems good to me. The um, lateridium is usually, you know, a lot of times it's completely red. And maybe the, maybe the margin's a little bit white, maybe even from uh, velar remnants. Uh, or maybe it's just a little pale, because sometimes they are. But lateridium, usually you don't see any green on it and, and not, not any yellow in my my experience right well, maybe, some, yeah, maybe so a little yellow on the cap maybe i'm sorry yeah let me take that maybe a little yellow on the cap gotcha all right. well that's all i had still probably not going to eat them <laughs> yeah unfortunately spore morphology doesn't do you a whole lot of good um the spore sizes are pretty similar for all three species um, i think one of them tends to be a little bit larger but um the, the spore dimensions over for all three species, there's overlap. And all three of them have that same spore deposit that you see kind of on this little ring there, that purplish brown. It's always dark purplish brown. All the hyphalomas are like that, yeah. Yeah. including the like the ones that are, are not, don't grow on like logs and things. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks for the knowledge. Okay, I'm going to jump in here and share the screen. I believe Marcel is the first person here. Can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Okay. There you go. Okay. I first. Yeah. Okay. I, I think so, but I'm not sure. Uh, so I found like five or six of these on the ground that is kind of hummus and leaves and pine needles in the pine barrens. And um, I found one Igrophoros in Philip's book that is shows up at this time is called Igrophorus laurenci, but many things coincide, but not the size of the spores. So I put that name in there and I cross it because I'm not sure. It, he says that it smells like cedar and this smells really good. It has the, the current gills, but I just don't know it. Does anybody have any clue? How, how big are the spores? Uh, uh, all right, the, the, the spores for Laurency are really Yeah, big. pretty small. Mm -hmm. And I put large because I only saw few. In general, they look like this size. The, the large, not too many of them. Yeah. Yeah, and the spores for Laurency are bigger, like more than eight. So no, the spore size doesn't coincide. Well, there's a, several of these um, whitish hygrophorus mushrooms that come out in fall. Yeah. There's, and there's a few different ones. Yeah. Also, did you consider Clitosibi? No, no, I like that name. Yeah, so now, now the gills on, on hygrophorus are waxy. Um, and those look like they might be, but those, these also, the parts that are coming down the stalk, Look mm -hmm. kind of thick and waxy. Um, Actually, 
Yeah. And it was sticky. Yeah, a lot, a lot of fall mushrooms are sticky, but you know what? Usually the cladocybes are not. Okay, okay. It was probably hygrophorus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. It's okay. Marisol, do you own oh. the do you own the wax cap book by the Bassettes? No, I have one. I ha actually I have a book. I forgot. Oi, where is it? I'm trying to find it. Oh, jeez. Give me one second, okay? Please. Oh, geez. where is it? Oh, this is, is Cuphophilus a, a relatively large genus, or are there only a few in that? Yeah, this this could be Cuphophilus. His gills are pretty strongly decurrent. No, I can't find that book. I own a book. I forgot that I could like look in there. I can't find it. I found it. I have a book. It's called North American Species of Igrophorus, uh, Hessler and Smith. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> God, I forgot. I look at that. So it could be Igrophorus, Dave. Yeah, it could be Hygrophorus. Okay, okay. Or it could be it could be um, Cuphophilus. And your book is old. And um, you know what? That book probably has. Hygrophorus, Hygrocybe, Cuphophilus, and maybe one or two very small genera that are recent split offs all up together under the name Hygrophorus. But they belong to that bigger family, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, 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 the yeah I, I think it's the Hygrophoraceae. See, see, that's, that's what I, I mean. That's a legitimate family. Within that family. family. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're all in that. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I'm just looking, paging through the uh, wax cap mushrooms by the besets, but there, there are so many of those kind of whitish oh. hygrophorus. Yeah, there's a lot of these whitish ones. You're not, it would take a little time to really. Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't oh, think I they have all of them in there as well. I forgot to mention that I don't know if all uh, waxy caps have this white mycelium at, at base. I was going to mention that. That's more of a clitosomy thing. Ah, oh, okay, clitosomy. But okay. I don't know. I don't. I, I oh. don't know either. Do some hygrophorus have have basal mycelium like that? Oh, okay. I don't oh, know. That does not strike me as a hygrophorus trait. But uh, it is. I, it, it is interesting that you say it has a fragrant over, odor. It has a good odor. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of hygrophorus are fragrant. Okay. Or, or some of them smell bad too. So, um, but odors are common in. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, this one was found in the same place. It's in a friend's uh, backyard in the Pine Barrens, and I am so confused. I don't know if this is an Inocive or is a Fortinarius. When I look at the cap, it has fibrils. You can see that. And they're forming like a net. I don't know if Fortinarius could look like that. And the, the tip is really pronounced. It's, it was very pointy. The, the one on the top is a little dry, but it was really notorious. And it's growing uh, their oak and pines on moss. And they were so short. The style was almost like submerged in the sand. I think these are quartz. Oh, okay. Did you look at the gills under the microscope? Yeah, I did. What'd you find? Look at those, yeah. It was so cute. And it has um, calocystidia, but it was plain, like no mm, incrustations, no metulloids. But I was suspecting that it could be a cortinarius. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, what's that thing? 
Hmm? Oh, those. It's, it's like what goes in the gills, the flesh in the gills. Uh, yeah. So this thing came out. I squeezed it. <laughs> and it, I could not get a spore print. It didn't do it. it. It dried out and nothing left on the glass. But I can tell that the, the spores were kind of yellowish brownish. You can see the spores, some of the spores here mm -hmm. in this micro. Yeah, they actually look like they could be anosity spores, but I think these look more like quartz. The mushrooms look more like quartz to me. Yeah. Okay. Did they fade a whole lot when they dried out? No. It, it no. just shrunk. Just shrunk. shrunk. Okay. Sh shrunk. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. But it was kind of cute to do them. Yeah. To, the, the way they look and the short stem. Oh, and this one had four um, sterigmata and this one had one. It was kind of funny to find that. But in general, they have four uh, spores. This one has one on the center, upper center. Right. And I found only one of these. I could not make too much sense out of it. It looks like some kind of cystidia with a fat base, but there was only one. So I couldn't say anything about it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you can see the fibrilose cap, the third, the one that is on the side. Uh -huh. I mean, I don't know if Cortinarius look like that too. Could look like yeah, that. Yeah, they, they can. They could. Ah, okay. But, that is, yeah. but that's, a, that's kind of interesting. You know, it mm -hmm. does look a little like an anosity. That's why I call um, it inocive, but I know. Yeah, I think it's, I think these are quartz. Okay. Thanks. The gills look like quart gills. Okay. And the, uh, what about the twisted stems? The stem the um, kind of fibrose. Yeah, yeah. Not, not sure if that favors one or the other. Mm. All right. Are you looking at the color of the gills, Dave? That's making you think more. The color of the gills, the um, the spacing. They're kind of widely spaced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. You know, sometimes, sometimes I find it hard to to explain why I think one thing as opposed to another, but. I know there's a lot of quartz, and there's mm -hmm. these. There's a fair number of really small quartz oh. that people tend to overlook because, you know, a lot of quaternarius mushrooms are these great big fat purple things, you know. So mm -hmm. yeah. you tend you tend to think like on those terms, um, but there are some small quaternarius mushrooms, uh, a fair number of species. I'm looking in in a book here. I look in. All the books that I have, and nothing looks like that. I look at Ninocivi and Cortinarius, but it's not easy, but I try. Yeah, well, the problem is there, both of those are large genera mm. with a lot of, you know, mushrooms that don't have real distinctive features, so they don't mm -hmm. make it into the um, field guides. Mm. The, the LBM. <laughs> Yeah, LBS. Is there a right, exactly. shot right. of the uh, the ring zone? What did you say, Brandon? Is there a good shot of like from the side, maybe of a ring zone? No, there was nothing like that. No. I only look at the stipe with nothing on it, like mm. fi fibers. That was it. I mean, some of them look a little old, but I saw several that were fresh and the same thing. I didn't see any, only fibers. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I found this one in uh, at work. I was uh, coming out from my car to enter the building when I saw these white little bolts sticking up, and I said, "Oh, it came back!" So they are growing in the most arid part of the garden next to the um, this long piece of cement that the divider, I don't know the right name, 
and, um, and this is an area fully exposed to the sun. And that's where they, they were growing. And um, this is a puff ball on a stack and they push. And sometimes, not this year, but other times the stack is twisted. Like if it was very hard to push through. And when I examine the stacks, they are covered with debris and the cap and the, the stack. And as you can see uh, the, uh, in the place where the stack joins the, the ball, there are like two layers of skin there, you know, and in the neck, if I can call it, yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there are two layers of um, skin, whatever name that is. And there is one opening and the, spore, uh, the spores are like peach color. That's a pretty color. And those are the spores. Some are rounded and some were a little longer. And I, oh yeah, just to see the, the ornamentation. All right. Uh, I wrote the size of the cap on the observation. They're not too big. Uh, 1.5. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Do you see these very often? Yeah. Uh huh. That's how I, I know them from there. Like I saw them like three or four years ago. And then last year I didn't see them and like that on and off. Mm -hmm. But then I went to this friend's uh, house on his backyard and I found it again the same thing the same day yeah and I did spore prints for both work on the spores on both and they are the same thing they look the same so I mean, did you get the spores by cutting open the uh, puffball part no I through the opening you just I poke the tweezer in there and then you get the cottony stuff mm -hmm. the spores come like in, in with threads with, with, I don't know, Capilitium, I guess that's the right name. Yeah, we have a member here in, in the club I'm in here in Northeast PA who found some of these on near his barbecue in his backyard. Hmm. Um, it's an area where he spread like some really fine gravel or something. And hmm. um, I guess there's some soil underneath it and it's really and set up so it would drain really well um and so he found some of these a few years ago so i didn't know what they were at first we, we figured out what they you know we figured mm -hmm. the same thing out tools tulostoma i forget the species name we used mm -hmm. but yeah they've got those round spiny spores i think i remember that mm -hmm. and apparently these are most common like in deserts is, I think that's what I ended up reading. Oh, okay. I found this uh, in Smithville too. And the conditions are like the same: sandy soil and sandy like nothing, soil. grass and yeah. and sandy soil. Yep. Yeah, I I know Dave. I've seen some uh, stalk puffballs. I don't know if they're the same genus or not, but in like some desert field guides before. Because I always, you know, every time I see a field guide, I want to see what kind of mushrooms are in there. Yeah. You know, right. But I've definitely seen some some of this stuff in uh, the desert books I have. Batarrea is one of those uh, stuck puffballs. Batarrea, but the skin of the ball disintegrates and so like a puffy powdery ball is. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, those left. are different. Yeah. From the These desert. are really small too, aren't they? Yeah, they're, like they're, yeah. one point five centimeters cap is small. Oh really? That big? Wow, those are that's bigger than the ones um, that we found down over here. Oh, okay. Yeah, they they were under a centimeter, if I remember oh. correctly. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really small. And that was about two or three years ago, and and then they there were like two years in a row we found them, and then no more for a while. Mm -hmm. That's a cool find, so. <laughs> they look to me like lollipops. Okay, I still, I am not 100% sure. I am not 
100%. Sure, this is scleroderma cepa, but it's some kind of scleroderma. What um, is weird to me is the size is way too small. So this one, the smallest was one centimeter. The one near my finger, yep. But I was reading that scleroderma cepa is smooth. And these things don't look smooth. And the one that is bigger on the lower left, you see those black spots. I was laughing when I was doing the micro because it's attacked by another fungus. This little black hair-like fungus is growing in there. Yeah, I saw them. I just, this spitting on my seeds kind of fungus. Yeah. So I cut it to see that inside. And you can see the this, this color of the spores. I just had to read more about this scleroderma cepa. It has thick skin right here, but I am a little confused with the ornamentation because it, it's supposed not to have scales. Yeah, that's my my mm -hmm. um, understanding is scleroderma cepa has um, no Smooth. scales. Yeah. Yeah, the, there's, there are other scleroderma species. They don't uh, show okay. up in the um, field guides very often. Okay. Look on um, Champignon du Quebec. I think they oh, have. Okay. A, oh, okay. Yeah, I think they have a few sclerodermas there. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, the size was really tiny. And the spores, and they have this weird HIFA connecting them, like with inflations. I don't know. Because sometimes they, those are characters for identifying some species. Yeah. Uh, it's a little blurry, so you can see the ornamentation. Okay. Um, this again in my friend's um, backyard in the Pine Barrens. Mm. All these things were found like a, in um, he used to have a garden there and he abandoned it. So now grass grows on it. And I found these ones there too. And there are, I found a beautiful document about Tarseta and there are many species and some of them have a stipe and this one didn't have it. So there are two names for it, like synonyms, Cupularis and Crenata. Or, or tarseta crenata. They're super tiny, it's like less than two centimeters. And there were a few of them. The spores are like um, smooth, no ornamentation on the, no ornamentation. Kind of pointy, and this is a uh, hifa from the flesh, like towards the outside. And I got the ascus, the paraphyses, and the spores in this one. I could not find one ascus that I could measure right or stretching along. I don't know why, but I couldn't. And the paraphyses are like simple and had septa. It has few divisions. And the spores have one or two drops. And they, in the, in where I was reading about it, they, they talk about the crenate margin. Is that right, Dave? Crenate? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I had to leave the room for a minute. What's the species oh. here? Tarseta. Uh, cupula. Oh, okay. Yeah. There, there are two names accepted for that. Yeah, crenate, um, like fringe mm. kind of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is, is that what they're, they're? Oh, they're, yeah. I didn't because I don't see the the. Oh, I didn't see that. I don't top. see that zeta. Yeah, that makes sense. And they're, it has no no stipe, no foot. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Marcel. Thank you. All right, Dave. 
Any particular ones you want to do? There's more there than we need. Just start from the top. So I found these yesterday. Do you find these in the Pine Barrens? These um, these little tooth mushrooms that grow on pine cones. These were on oh, Scott's pine never, cones. never, never. That's a dream. I <laughs> keep looking and I can't find them. Yeah, the other the other pictures get better. Oh, I wish. Yeah, these pine cones were partially buried. Or, or in some cases, completely buried, and the mushroom was sticking up out of the ground. I think no spores fell, and they really, really shriveled and dried up in no time. So what? I didn't, I didn't do any micro on them. They're so hairy. They're yeah, very inside. hairy. Yeah, yeah, bristly kind of. Mm -hmm. Everything's small. You know, you need. Um, you can see there the lines on the palm of my hand, right? So you mm -hmm. can see how small this thing is. You um, were on your knees. How did you find them? I saw them, you know, well, I, I, I knew they grew there. Oh, well. I was I was kind of half looking for them. <laughs> so what kind of pine cones. Scott's fine. Yeah. I have a lot of this up where I am. Only that pine? No, the white pine? Well, it's where I see them most commonly. Is uh, I've never found them on white pine. Oh, that's white broad. I found I found a few of these at um, one of the big forays at a uh, small Paul Smith's. Beautiful. One of the sites is one of my stomping ground places, and yeah. that's where I see these most often every year. They're really cool little mushrooms, and they sort of winter over too. You can see them in the spring, and I know they're not fresh. Yeah, they seem to come out really late because I go to this spot quite often. It's close to my house. And um, I, I usually I don't see them until very late. Maybe it's because you know, maybe the grass dies back a little bit and they're easier to see. I'm not really sure. And they're really small, and when there's bigger mushrooms, they tend to get my attention sooner. Are they are they tough? Yeah, they're pretty fibrous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're 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 resilient. Well, look like. What do you think? Are those um, pine cones that fell uh, 12 months ago or are they this falls? I think they probably fell a while back because they were buried. Yeah. Might take yeah, a while. They got, they got shoved into the ground, I guess. You know, something yeah. stepped on them or whatever. I, I don't know. Yeah, they would be at least last year's cones. Yeah, that's an interesting observation, right? Yeah. That they're on older cones after they've been colonized for a while. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, that's really cool. Really cool mushroom. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I just found those yesterday. And the name again? Oh, God. What? <laughs> um, Oliscapium vulgari. Oliscapium, right. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Okay. So, I, when I first saw this this stuff on a on a log, it's a hemlock log. I went back today and got more because I want to see if I can get more spores to look at. But at first, I thought they were some kind of asco, some little cup-like things. Um, hey, they look like the ones I found. Oh, yeah. what was the, the corticioides? They do look like that, don't they? Yes, I remember, I remember them. Yes, they do. Dacrymyces, what? Corticioides, what? something like that. Corticioid, corticioides, mm -hmm. or something yeah. like that. On the corticated mm -hmm. wood. Now, what? How big were the spores on yours? Oh, you'll have to look at my paper. I look, I look. I'll find the paper. You just talk. I can look at the page. Yeah, for what I didn't know they were Jacromyces till I got them home and started looking for stuff with the microscope. So the closest I, I came was um, Jacromyces, 
I think it's various spores or something like that. But oh. the spores should should be like way different, like widely, you know, a big range in size. And these are fairly homogeneous. I mean, some are a little bigger than others. Um, but the one thing I didn't check, uh, the reason why I want to get some more spores to look at, and I have some lying out now, hopefully some spores will drop. Uh, I need to see how, how many septa um, are on the spores. I so you can see here no that septa. no septa. Well, a few of the ones that I saw, I oh. think had, had some septa, but I didn't look with my better microscope. I just, I just took a picture to be able to get spore measurements. Yeah. So you can see the tuning fork, Bassidia. Yeah. yeah, right there. Yeah. I, I can thank cool. you my observation. Yeah, I can I can find the info now. I can't. I did put the name that you had from last week in the uh, chat. Dr. Oh, it's in there? In the chat, the name that Marisol oh. had last week. Dr. Oh. Mice. Corticio Odes. Corticio. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, because they do look just like that. All right. Yeah, well, I I'll definitely was an check that out. Different, yep. The, 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 those veins is what, yeah. I was looking and I could not make sense out of it. Yours was on conifer? I cannot remember the wood was decorticated. Uh, yeah, this was definitely hemlock. I went back today oh, okay. to the spot and, and examined the, um, the down tree very closely. And it's a hemlock. Nice. Okay, good, thanks. Hey, so, I found the measurement of the force 19.7 to 20.9, but 7.4. Oh, wow, these aren't that big. But you know what? You should check then various forests. I think that's what it's called. I found that one before too. Completely. Oh, you did? Because that's the one that has the really big spores. Yeah, 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 yeah. I found that one and it has up to seven divisions. I remember. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One. That's the one with the yeah, yeah, yeah. seven septa. Yeah. I have found both. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Corticoides. Ah. Es dacrimaisis corticoides. Okay. All right. Well, I'll check that out. I don't, I don't think I came ac across that name. I never even heard. It was somebody, John, J Jean, uh, I can't remember. Somebody gave it to me. No, I never heard about that. Right. I'll check that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll see what I can find. <laughs> Might be hard to find anything on it. So I'm just joining the crowd of uh, stereum <laughs> observers here. <laughs> and... Um, so this is what I would have called complicatum, although complicatum is usually more yellow than this, but so I don't the know. Cold, the cold weather made poorly. Ah, uh, the cold weather. Now these, um, they, I rubbed them, they didn't stain, they didn't bleed. Um, they, they're on hardwood. This is, um, looks like it might be beach. Um, it's not conifer, that's for sure. So the one, there's a close-up photo here where you get a kind of a nice look at. I think it might be the, the one after this one. And I did get spores. Spores fell out of this thing. So the color is kind of muted here. So you can see that sort of the texture pretty well. That's more of the color that you usually see. This one. Yeah, this this mm -hmm. is a little bit muted though. The other The other pictures look a little bit more like what they actually looked like in situ. Um, and the underside didn't look like really anything because it was mostly all stuck to the to the wood. But I did get some spores to drop. I thought that was kind of interesting. Pretty quickly, I there was a noticeable spore print and I was able to get spore dimensions. I somebody's cooking and it's very noisy, please. Oof. Let me do this. Yeah, it's too noisy, ouch. You guys, just unmute yourself after I do this. There we go. All right. 
So, wow, you got spores off of it, huh? That's pretty cool. Yeah, spores fell in, in, in no time. I, it seems to me that with polypores and other similar things, these are not polypores, but um, if you pick them in the winter and bring them home, um, as they warm up, they it kind of reactivates them and spores fall. I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> now, I don't know if that's always true, but it seems uh, to me um, to be they, a reasonable hypothesis. Yeah. I never thought about that, the temperature inside the house, because but what I have done many times, and it works in most cases, is I spray them a little bit of water with a spray. Oh. And then yeah, yeah. You put it on this light, and the next day you'll see the spore print. Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To yeah, yeah. To reactivate it, bring it back to life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is what I would call complicate them. If you didn't get any, sta if you didn't get any staining on it, right? And there's no staining, and there's no, no bleeding, and there's not like excessive amounts of hair on it, right? No, nah, it's just a kind of really, really finely velvety, I guess. You know, it kind of looks that way. I mean, I didn't really notice any hairs. Maybe, maybe some really small ones along. Yeah, the that ones. looks like a cap right at the top, right? Yeah. And it's always like troops of them. It's like yeah, there many. were a bunch of them on a log. It's, yeah. it's so common. Yep. Okay, so complicate them. That's what I propose. Um, because I, 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 you know, that's pretty much what I would always call complicated. But, but now that sterium's been kind of um, re reevaluated in North America, there's, you know, some new things to learn. Number four. Okay, let's see. What do we have here? Oh, okay. So. I just wondered if anybody might have a, an idea because um, these are small. They're, you know, about the size of my thumbnail, you know, maybe one and a half centimeters wide, maybe, maybe close to two centimeters wide. They're kind of flexible and the pores are um, irregular and, and some not quite Dadelaide, but sort of verging on Dadelaide. So you can see here the pores. So I don't know. I didn't propose anything, but the only thing that comes to my mind would be maybe Tremites gibosa, maybe young ones, you know, that are still soft, but they're also very small. No, Tremites, no. Not Even Tremites Tremites, gibosa. No. When it's very young, you can tell it's something particular about the, the, the pores. And this one seems like hairy yeah this uh yeah it's a little bit hairy along the margin yeah. i guess yeah and these are soft yeah they're bendable you can bend them pretty easily so is it like like some sort of like a ligosporus or tyromyces type thing i was thinking the tyromyces treptoleuca did you see what kind of wood it was what kind of rod it had was it like a white or a brown no nah, you know i have to remember to pay attention to that because <laughs> that, that, that would probably that would separate. I think out. it was on hemlock actually. So tyromyces, what 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 species? No, I'm not sure, but the proleuca. Isn't the new book about the polypus? Yeah, I don't yeah. have a species either, but that's what I would guess. Either tyromyces or an oligosporus. Okay. On, like, this all right. Really good. So I don't feel so bad about being confused by this one because the only. <laughs> <laughs> the only tyromyces I know is um, Chionius. Oh, look, it looks like a, that looks like brown rot, doesn't it? If, oh, yeah. If, if that's the same. Oh, okay. So that would point Ooh, towards, a, that would be a ligophorus, probably. Oh. All right. I'll look because, that up. Thanks. Because my, my understanding is that their tyromyces and oligosporus are, I can't, I'm not sure if it's like a sporus or porus, but they're really similar to each other, but the tyromyces, does a white rot and oligoporus does a brown rot. Oh, interesting. And oligoporus, okay. I think, is more common on conifer. Yeah, this was on hemlock. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's hemlock. So you remember the name oligoporus? I wrote it down. Thanks. All right. 
All right, and this is number five. So I know, you know, this gets shown once in a while. It's a pretty cool thing to find. And I'm, so I thought I had known what I had figured this out in the past, but now I really think I know it because I've seen it here on Taxonomy Tuesday a few times. This photo is not particularly good. This photo just shows the in situ, you know, the way it was growing on the underside of a log. The other photos are a little better. So yep. these I think are zoomable and you can mm -hmm. see some, some yeah, details. It is. It is. Yeah, I, and I got some spores to fall off of this thing too. You can see the spines. Spines are pretty long. You can't tell how long they are here because you're looking at them head, sort of head, head on. Um, I think one of the other photos there, you can see them at an angle a little bit. So you can see this, the spines are fairly, fairly long. Um, a pretty distinctive uh, mushroom, really. Mm -hmm. Is this thing, what is this thing considered? Is it, what uh, family uh, is it in? You want me to look in the book? I yes, forgot. They're in polyphorales, see. I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I mean the, I, the, the microstructure is what you ask? No, no, the, no, I just want to know what family they're in. But I did get a picture of, of one of the, I think actually the, the, the one micro photo I have shows two of the, um, those like encrusted, I think there's two of them there right alongside each other. That's why it looks like it's thick. And one's like in the shadow of the other one, but you can see the, the, right. the upper, like two fifths is is a different color. It's like darker and, and a little more ragged. So that's like the encrustation, I guess. It's called Esqueletosisteria. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. So it comes from the, uh -huh. from the flesh, from the, it crosses the whole, you know what I'm trying to say, the flesh. Oh, I can't say that. Context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's exerted. And maybe because this book is so old, they belong to the Estekerinaceae. <laughs> that's, oh. <laughs> I, yeah, I just looked it up on Wikipedia and that's yeah. what it says on there too. Yeah. Stekerinaceae in the yeah. order polyporales. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's a small family probably then, right? Just. Is there um, is there more than one genus in that family? Well, was this growing was this growing on um, conifers or, or hardwood? I'm not sure. It was a really old rotting log. Is it here on the yes. underside? There's only genus, I think. There's tons of genus. There's tons of genera, and not tons, but there's a lot of genera in there. So oh. exam examples like Antrodiella, you probably have heard that one. Um, oh, yeah. Nigroporus. Sometimes we look at a Nigroporus here. Loeomyces, like Loeomyces frag, uh, fractopes, we see that one. Metroloidea, all those those fragrant ones that I'm always showing off, they're in that family. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Stecorinum, of course. Oh, okay. Younghunia, Younghunia is in there. We see that sometimes. Oh, they even call that one Stecorinum. It used to be called Younghunia, and now it's Stecorinum uh, nitidos. Nitida, nitido. Okay, yeah. So they're bouncing. The genera are getting bounced, or they're getting species are getting bounced around the genera within that family. Mm -hmm. May I say something? Luke, where did you see that, real quick? That's on Wikipedia. So that's um. You know, hang on one second, Marisol. Yeah. If, when we're whenever like we're like trying to figure out families and like orders and stuff like that, Wikipedia is really good. If you just look up, I just look up Stecorinum and click on that, and then from there I can bounce up and down and. They have like the whole scientific classification usually in there. And then usually there's like a folder that has all the genera in it. Gotcha. Yeah, because that's where I am. And I went to Stecorinaceae. Yep. I was looking, I was looking for the different genus in there and I was wondering where to find that. If you scroll down, I'm on a phone. So if you scroll down, there's like a little drop down box of, you know, it says taxonomy, phylogenetics, description. Genera and references. If you click on genera, it gives you a whole list of genera. Oh, nice. uh, there you are. Uh, gotcha. Because I was just seeing the type genus and it's Stecorinum, obviously. Yes. Stecorinum um, according to the Quebec site, is mainly on hardwoods. 
but and I wanted to say that to go ahead, go ahead. And yeah, well, I, I don't know what kind of wood this was. It was yeah. really rotten. This it was is very another old. one that grows on conifers. So it could be, it could have been that one too. Is what, that what you were going to say? Is there a difference in floor size? Stecherine and colloidy, collo, collo, Colloid. Yeah, you know what? That one's on that one's on Champignon to Quebec. I looked at that. Yeah. I don't think this is it. Oh, okay. Is that what yeah, you were but, gonna say, Maricel? No. I was going to say that according to the book that I have here, it says habitat. On dead wood of broad leaf trees, especially fagus, beech, more rarely on conifers, with or without bark. Yeah, this probably was on beach. There's a lot of beach in the area um, where, where I found those. Uh, but there's also hemlock, you know, but I don't, I don't think it was, I think this was on beach. There's, there's a picture of the spores. The spores are some of the smallest spores I've, I've ever oh, seen. Yes. Uh -huh. and yeah, they're tiny. They're like four by two. Yep, yep. And these little, little round things are just air bubbles or dirt or something. But you <laughs> see the spores are they're like these little pill shaped yeah. things. Yeah, they're really small. Mm. I think I, I think I estimated at four by two, but the two might be a stretch. They're probably a little under two. The width. You, want, you want me to tell you from the book? Yeah, sure. Okay, let me open it again. One twenty-seven. Yeah, I, I, the sport dimensions checked out with what I could find online. Uh. I lost the page. Give me one second. It was a big patch, and, uh, too. Just looking at mushroom, mushroom observer. You think this is Ocre, Ocracium? Ocracia. Ocracia? Yeah. Ocracia or Ocracium? Ocracium. Okay. This part here, oh, I'm sorry. No. Paul was saying that they're like three centimeters across. So that looks a lot bigger than three centimeters, the fruit bodies. Oh no, I have found longer than that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I think these, these kinds of things. Which ones? Red. Yeah, I think there's a lot of variation red. in that. Yeah. Okay. okay. The spores size in this book, it says 3.5 to 4 by 2 to 2 5. Yeah, well, there you go. That's, That's pretty these small. Spores are right in yeah. there. Yeah. You know, I'll say, I what about the other? What about the other species, the cord of? Whatever. What are the sports size for that? Oh, I, I think don't have one species. Okay, species. I'll, I'll look later. I, I think yeah. that one's on on Quebec, but I think I don't think that one has the big teeth. Which one? The other one, the uh, the one that grows on conifer. Oh, I don't know that one. What's the name? The what? The one that Nina said. What's the um, name, Nina? Nina. We couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. I, I had to unmute. Um, <laughs> uh, the spore size on on the uh, C O L L A B E N S is okay. three uh, three point five to five by one to one point five. Even narrower. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, a little longer though. A little longer and and now. So those are more, the Q is going to be different on those. Right. The Q is probably going to be well, well bigger than two. That looks conifer, the tree. Right. Oh, right here? Yeah. yeah. It kind of um, does. Yeah. Oh, geez, it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was going to say, Maybe too. Maybe that is hemlock. Listen, I was going to say, too, and I'm looking at this, these spines do look really big for Acrasia. Because I, I noticed when I find this stuff, you know, it starts out like kind of Lumped. white, white, and just like little lumps, and mm -hmm. they do get the spines on them. And sometimes the spines are so small. I I need my magnifying glass. I know I'm getting older, but you know, <laughs> they are pretty. So you small. think this is the other? This might be the other one then. Yeah, that does look like hemlock. Hmm. Did you measure your spores? Yeah, four. They're they're as I estimated like four by two. They they're all pretty much the same. I mean, this one here that's on um, near where the arrow is right now, a little below that. 
to the yeah, left. I guess that one looks like it's not like it's angled, so I don't think we're getting a good look at that one. Yeah, as I was say, I guess when they get this small, it's hard to really accurate. Yeah, it's hard to tell which ones are aligned, you know. But okay, so this could this is the other one. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll I'll check that out. How do you spell that one? I don't know it. Nina knows. Oh, oh. oh yeah, I gotta go back. It's in my Michael Quebec. Uh, okay. It's there. Okay, I'll I'll look that up. It's okay, oh, C C O L L A B E N S. Thanks. Colabits. Okay. All right. So that's probably what that is then. Uh, but I'll I'll check that out. Cool. Yeah. We're expanding our species. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thank you, Dave. Oh, thank you. I got that one wrong. Okay, Marius. Yeah, we, uh, let's start the first one. <laughs> I I have to admit, um, uh, I couldn't get a, a, a better focus on this. You can zoom in. It was quite high up on a branch, and you 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 all know I'm pretty tall. Um, does it look like a pores or spines in there? I couldn't really see that well. Pores. Pores. I think yeah. they're pores. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is the closest I get to it. Uh, but uh, I thought it was a Trimedes, uh, 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 was it Pubicens? But uh, the, that have, has teeth in it, and these have uh, pores. So, what do you guys think this is? I was going to say pubescence. Pubescence. It's hard to say without seeing the tops of them, but yeah, but this is so high up. This is the best I could get. I think oh, even... And it's on a, on a cherry. It's an ornamental, ornamental cherry. But they probably don't care where they grow. See, this is the one I was looking at here. You can kind of kind of see some of the cap, and it doesn't look very uh, hairy. Yeah, like, like here, suit would be much hairier, right? Mm -hmm. And pubescence is just kind of finely fuzzy. Uh, just the fuzzy. In the, in the right, you can see the, the yeah, uh huh. Oh, you passed it. Your, put your cursor a little higher. Are you oh, talking about? No, on the lower one. Here? The lower one. Mm -hmm, right there, right there. I could see the pubescent thing that you're talking about. Yeah, it's kind yeah, of fuzzy, fuzzy right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. So you think that's pubescence as well? Tramedes, okay. Tramedes pubescence. No, I don't know pubescence yet. I only know it's soot and it's not a soot. Yeah, right. Okay, I think it is. The, I think it's pubescence. That's what I would call that. So you, okay. got some other, you got some other stuff going on there too. Some kind of little orange That's things. Cool, cool canker. Yeah, but uh, that, that, that whole big fat branch is going. Uh, these guys are probably first out, you know starting the race to consume that log that, that that tree it's going to be interesting i walk past it every time uh, i walk the dog in a different route so i'll keep my eyes on those little uh, red dots and see what comes out i always get really confused on these but can you call that little canker something that was once entrodia i don't know where they all went but I, I'll just keep my eye on it uh, and see what uh, if, if anything comes back out, you know. Um, I'll, I'll see if there's any logs also dropping down and get my hands on it. What, what, are, you, what are you saying, Brandon? The red things, the little red wrinkled things the, that are the, going the, below it, below the poison. And I'd like to ask, is it usual or common to find ones these intact at this season? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They they grew in the fall, and they're pretty. These things are like tough, quirky things. They'll hang. Yeah, they very, very. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen them. I uh, handled some of them before. Uh, now that you guys ID'd it, yeah. although you will find a lot of times on the undersides when you look at the undersides closely, little teeny tiny larvae in these things, living overwintering up in there, and I think when it warms up. Like just a little bit, like you know, might get into the 40s. Maybe the sun's on it. 
the larvae become active and actually start eating it. So they do slowly degrade over the winter. I think I read somewhere that these larvae, they're larvae of fungal gnats, they actually have some kind of antifreeze in their, uh, in their blood or you know, whatever they have, their bug blood, that keeps them from, you know, from dying from their cells from rupturing as they freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw. And that's how they get through the winter. And then in the spring, they pupate and fly off as little fungal gnats. Amazing. Sounds tasty. Yeah. And, and you'll, you'll, like, if you start looking, you'll actually see them pretty often. Like, they're little teeny tiny orange things. Bill Yule, mm -hmm. Bill Yule, um, he did that talk for us back in the fall on, last fall on uh, insects and mushroom associations. He's been trying, I always follow him on Facebook. He's been trying to incubate these little things over and over to try to get them to hatch so he can get an identification on them because they're much easier, I guess, to identify once they uh, pupate into their actual adult form. But he's yeah. been unsuccessful so far. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, for the fungus gnats, the shape of the wings are very important uh, distinction, uh, uh, the way to, to distinguish between them. It look, the red things that Brandon was talking about below. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I did, I did. That brings up an interesting idea. Maybe studying those fungal gnats could lead to the development of the first ever biodegradable organic antifreeze. Yeah. Sure, there's something of interest in there, right? Uh, you should. There's something in there that uh, a, a type of glycol something in the blood, you know, in the cells. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Uh, from South Africa, I thought I'll share you something. I, I we we really don't know what it is. We just took a lot shot at it. Um, but yeah, on on on. On the cultured lawn, already call it the maintained lawn. Uh, these things are pretty common on the golf courses or in and uh, in, 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 in fields. Uh -oh. Even thinking that he needs to show the gills. Yeah, but sorry, this is somebody had sent me the photos. No, I have no, to put... You forgot to tell him for the next time. <laughs> yeah, no, next time I'll tell them to dig the dig it out, turn it over, whatever. But. Uh, I just thought I'll, I'll share some uh, South African mushrooms, see how they look. Might, maybe something similar. It's just interesting how, how, how uh, transparent that edge of that cap is. Or, or is it just that it's striations of how it, it dries over the gills? You see, this, uh, if you zoom in, that striations mm -hmm. at the end. Is there anything similar here in North America? That just to, on, on the looks. And then, my guess. Sorry? No. Amanita. An Amanita. Yeah. yeah. It looks like there's a little bit of an annulus there. Right yeah. There. Uh -huh. But don't they have white gills? Not always. Oh. Always pure white anyway. Well, yeah, I need to educate my, my team in South Africa, <laughs> my, my scouts. <laughs> and uh, I thought I'll show, show you some, some other things also. This is in uh, my sister-in-law's uh, uh, backyard. Wow. Okay, uh, well, she- That she, is so she, beautiful. Yeah, but that thing is, uh, is we call it, uh, in, in my, uh, it has, uh, it's named in my mother tongue, the, the, the uh, 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 boom slung. That's uh, what we call it. A boom means tree, slung means snake, tree snake. But uh, very beautiful, extremely venomous. You don't want to get bit by this thing. His jaws open at 170 degrees angles, angle, and they actually have the fangs at the back of its throat. So uh, I once fell out of a very big tree, uh, climbing my way up a water tower, uh, and I encountered one of these guys. So I let everything go. I, I felt pretty hard that day out of that water tower. But uh, yeah, I just put the thought I'll share with you guys, just for interesting. 
How long do they grow? These guys, um, three, four feet. Mm, it's big. Nah, not really. This bigger snakes where that one comes from. Cool. It's a cool snake. It's a very beautiful one. I actually have uh, it in black and white uh, tattooed on my calf, calf here. So, anyways. Cool. Thanks, Mars. Off I go. Okay. So these are my finds. These are from last Friday down in the Pine Barrens. So still a fair amount of stuff down there growing. Now is he no Boria, no even no Caete anymore. No, oh, that's what these guys say. Who knows? Hidnoporia uh, <laughs> uh, tabacina. That's what I call this. Although I'm never quite sure with these things because there's a few of them. Tabacina is in reference to the color, like colored like tobacco. Whoa. So this was a really a quite look. Look at this stick. This is a big wow. stick. This was the whole stick was a couple of feet long. So. Wow. I'm sorry. Ferruginosa. Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> so I, I I don't know. I could be wrong in this. This I didn't explore like all the possibilities here. Um, I know Tabasina, I was reading, um, they will have these resupinate, I'm sorry, these um the reflexed portions here, which I didn't get a great photograph of these, but see this on the on the right hand side here, all this stuff, that's all reflexed cat material that's all kind of conjoined and growing about maybe two centimeters out from the uh, stick. So. So really beautiful color on it. If you look at it too, it's, it's pretty smooth. Although it, there's some more pictures of the cat material. So. There is also one called Cinnamomea. That color could be Cinnamon. Yeah, could be. And there's the, um, you know, what are they, the setae. Yep. This is a 20 times, so all these little spines. Wow. Sticking up. So I was just trying to take a picture through a 20 times scoop there. There's some more of the set type. So these little spines. So how do you do that photo? I'm just holding a camera up to a dissecting scope. Oh. oh, okay. Okay, these, I, I was happy to find these. I've never seen these before, except for in books. Cultraciella dependens. Hmm. So these are little polypores, sort of, I should call them a polypore. They're actually in the same family, I think, as that last thing, the Hymeno KDACA. So these are, really, these are really small. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's a beautiful photo. All oh. the details of the drops and yeah, there was a lot going on underneath this log. Yeah. There were there was this, there is serpula, there's some other white crust going on, and then there's all these spider webs. Mm -hmm. So these yeah, are about that may, yeah, that may not be spider webs. There's some of these uh, uh larvae that lives uh, underneath, like you mentioned, them the uh, the mushroom larvae also actually spun uh Salt like this. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know other animals do spend silk too. Silk and other sort of little things. So, but these were about two centimeters across. Um, these are underneath of the log. So this is the pore surface, but it's actually, this part is actually hanging downward. And this one, that's the point of attachment. Which I have a different photograph to show that. And that orangey stuff is part of the attachment too. Yeah, mm -hmm. that stuff, right? That's something else, right? Yeah, that, that's no, not... no, no, it's part of the attachment. I have seen it many times. Oh yeah, part of the same fungus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can see it here on the stipe, the short stipe. It sits around the the the, 
the color of the stipe. Yeah. Yeah, I have seen it. Look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there, there you go. You can kind of see there's a lot of that stuff going on. So a little blurry there, but I'm trying to show that these things are pretty small. So there's another one. That's actually see that's that's the stipe. And this is upside down. I had flipped the log. So this these this was the other direction. So these were facing downwards. So the pores were facing downwards. So these were hanging like little pendants off the bottom of this log. Pine, so, yes? Yes, pine. Mm -hmm. So that was a fun find. Do they always grow on the underside of the a pine? Yeah, or inside. In a, like a hollow piece of and they hang upside down like that yeah that's so weird yes it is weird okay so i have this one rigiporus cuneatus so you showed this oh, two yes. weeks ago dave you're still there dave you yeah you sure yeah, this, that this is Igor just had one of these sequenced, and I saw the results posted on Mushroom Observer. Yeah, it was it was one of yours. Yeah, it was one, it was one of ours that we did for fundus. So I went mm -hmm. back to the same tree that I found the one last year, and here they are growing on the same tree again, same uh, Atlantic white cedar. So you can see how small they are. That's my finger there. They're really tiny little things. These little pores underneath of it. I see. Do, they, do they get bigger than this? I don't think so. I think they're always, you know, a centimeter or two. So I have down here. Was somebody else saying something? I was saying that it looked perennial because there is a new growth on below the old thing. Yeah. I don't know why my notes aren't showing up here. I I saved some notes in there. Um, maybe perennial, but it didn't seem like there was nearly as much on this tree this time around. Is there, like, there we go. There's a photograph of it. Last year, when I photographed it, I was trying to find a link to the one from last year. The growth was much more pronounced, like much bigger pieces all growing, you know, many more caps all joined together. I so, wrote, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Marisol. I found it a few times in the in Chatsworth, Pine Barrens, even Franklin Parker in on White Cedar. But okay. I could never identify now. I know it. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, thank you. Yay. You're welcome. Now I thank Igor for doing the work of uh, sending in the sequence or sending in the specimens and getting the sequences back. Because yeah, I found this last year, and I did a bunch of microscopy on it, and I came up with this name, well, Oxyporus. So it's been, it's getting shuffled around, but um, last year I was calling it Oxyporus cuneatus. These guys are calling it Rigidoporus cuneatus, but the same mushroom, and um, it seems. In the Pacific Northwest, they find it on some sort of cedar up there. And there was a handful of observations and that's why I identified it from, but I was a little bit uncertain because there's only one other um, observation I could find anywhere on the East Coast. And that was up in New York, but again, on cedar. So, you know, when there's that, that small of amount of uh, observations around the uh, continent, so, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to feel confident, right? But yeah, we so we got a we got the sequenced and it came back and that's what they said. All right, this is this was under the same log. There was a ton of this this weekend. Serpula mantioides. growing on conifer. This is all underneath the same log with that Cotris, Cotrisiella. Mm -hmm. So this is the very young stuff. Look how like pinkish. Pink. Yeah, the outside edge is like pink. Mm -hmm. When it's very mature, the margin disappears. Oh yeah. I found it with no margin and completely like olive, dark olive. 
Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I have some other observations of it too, where it is darker and not nearly as pretty. Like this stuff was really pretty, I thought. That's a cool photo. A lot going on on that log. Yeah. There was a lot of this stuff on Friday. I mean, every third log I was flipping over had some of it growing. It's all down inside of there. See all down in there? Mm -hmm. Really colonizing that log. What park did you go? I went to um, the Carranza Memorial. Oh, okay. That's uh, one of my that's becoming one of my more favorite places to go. I go there and I hike past the campground and there's like some loops back there. It's like a pretty bad road, yeah? Yeah, yeah, there's roads, but there's also trails. Okay, okay. So, and then this one, I wanted to throw up here. This is another one that we had sent in for fundus that I was kind of happy, to, I was happy to get this one back. Um, these are what we always called um, Poro de Dahlia pinei. That's what I keep saying, species one. Yeah. 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 I, I know we. Told me and I keep saying that they don't believe me. <laughs> well, I know you and I have talked about this. We decided that this, we, we made a really good educated guess, right? That this is species one. So there was a paper that came out just a couple of years ago um, by these guys. Uh, Wu et al. I know Joseph Flasic was on there. He's a really well-known polypore guy with a lot of experience here in the Eastern United States. I don't know these other guys so well, but um, they put this paper out in 2019, kind of trying to revise Poro de, de Alia, de Adalia for around the world. And they pointed out that pine is a European species. And then, you know, they sequenced a bunch of stuff from North America and came up with, I think, four different species. And there was one that existed in Virginia and Georgia in what seemed like it was probably similar pine barren habitats. And they call that one species one. So we sent this one in into fundus for sequencing and we got the sequence back and it lines up pretty, pretty well with species one. So I think we can be pretty confident that we this is species one. Okay. Yeah, I understood that it was for the east. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. But they didn't actually have any records of it in New Jersey. Their records were from a little further south. Mm. So up yeah. until now, it was up until now it was just kind of an educated guess. But okay. I think we have some a little bit of. Uh, I actually got spores off of this one. This was from last year. But I got spores that drop off of it. So some spore measurements in there as well. So again, thank you, Igor, for doing that footwork. With some uh, good information that came back in that round. No problem. There's a bunch of stuff that I'm doing with the sequences, and it's just one of the uh, data points. But yeah, it was very satisfying to uh, be able to match it to something that actually is published legit. So you go into the uh, accession and there's a paper there, a reference, and you go and, you know, you provided the uh, the reference, but uh, in the metadata for the accession, that paper is there too. So you can go and see the trees and discussion and all that stuff, which is, which is nice. As opposed to just like, you know, uh, an accession with no references or um, no vouchers to look at, nothing. Yeah, I mean, this stuff really confirms the idea. Yeah, cool. Whichever name it's going to become, it doesn't matter. But you know, we know this is the you know the species, species one. Yep, and it's existing up and down the east coast and in these presumably all pine barren habitats. Right, right. It probably just crawled up from the south, like a lot of fungi, you know, along the uh, coastal plain. You know, there in Texas and Florida, and all of a sudden you find them in New Jersey as well. Uh, Igor, is there any chance that you send me the link? to prove that that's the name for our species in the East so I can show this in nine naturalists and they can correct the name. Uh, what do you want me to do? The link to the name? For the document or, yeah. Oh, the paper? You mean the paper? Yeah. 
It's right here. Uh, I think it's an observation. I think I gave it a link actually there. Oh, okay, okay. It's okay. either an observation or it's under the name. If you click on the name and go to the name page, there's going to be a link to the paper that I left there. Okay. Thanks. Right here. Okay, right here, Marisol. If you go here. You mean mushroom observation? Yeah, mushroom, mushroom, mushroom observer. If okay. you go, if if you go to this observation, mm -hmm. you can see down here in this conversation. You can see oh. right here in this conversation. There's the link to it right there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the link to the uh, to the website that has the information, but you have to basically copy and paste the title and then search it online. And I think ResearchGate has that, you know, uh, oh, paper. Okay, I, get yeah. I, can, I can also email it to you. No, I always I get to ResearchGate many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's in the public domain, so you can see it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Free. Yeah, for free, for a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go, Marisol. There's the, there's a link right to that observation. Okay. I mean that that the link to that observation should be pretty uh, sufficient to show that that's the species. Yeah. Uh, uh, just for information, if uh, anybody wants uh, scientific papers, uh, just contact me. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I I have uh, through my work a lot of subscriptions that I can get access to. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Marius. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So is there anybody else that has anything they want to share? About 20 minutes left. We can always go back and look at the rest of Dave's stuff. If... Yeah, that's always interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you're on. Dave, I you sleeping? All right. Oh, he's awake. Dave's awake. He's awake. <laughs> I am. <laughs> we kept him awake. <laughs> no, that, that last thing was really interesting. Um, you guys figured that out. That's really good work. You figured it out before the sequence came back. So that was, that was pretty good. I uh, just figured out, even though it's just unnamed. Nobody nice. believed. Nobody believed us though. <laughs> As they say, without the DNA sequence, it's just a rumor. <laughs> that is what they say. <laughs> All right, here you go, Dave. All right. Let's see what we got Thomas. next. Hi, Thomas. Oh, there we go. Hypholoma. So this hypholoma capnoides, I I considered possibly being fasciculare, but it was, but it tastes, I went back today and, and picked some more off the same log and it tastes mild. Oh, I think I may have tasted these also. Um, but they look a little, the gills were a little bit greenish or yellowish, even though they're old. You don't see it in the photo. It didn't come through. Um, but the one, these gills really look like, they don't look like um, fasciculare to me. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure this is capnoides. Um, but the, these chrysocystidia are very interesting. That's this, this last photo. Um, they turn golden yellow in KOH. Um, and so one of the things that's interesting about these wood dwelling hyphalomas, they have these chrysocystidia, they're pleurocystidia that turn golden yellow in KOH. And, um, so is this, are these two you see here, are they abruptly tapered or are they mucronate? <laughs> so, or submucronate? Um, and then there's another word as well that I think I put into the notes that I forget <laughs> um, that used to describe these cystidia. So if you look on Champignon du Quebec and Mushroom Observer and compare what they say about these chrysocystidia, there doesn't seem to be any really strong agreement on whether to call them um, mucronoid, submucronoid. <laughs> tapered, or there's another word too, but attenuated. Yeah. So, so which is it? <laughs> I 
And actually, if you look on, um, I forget which one it is, Mushroom Expert or, or Quebec, they have a picture of some of these uh, plural cystidia. And so the ones that you see here, they, they look more like the fasciculari ones, I think maybe on Mushroom Expert. Um, so it's a little bit confusing. So I find the difference between capnoides and um, fasciculari to be a little bit confusing, but I'm pretty sure these are capnoides. This was on hemlock. So I'm sorry, somebody was asking a question? Um, I don't know. I didn't hear anybody. Oh, okay. Yeah. What else do we have? Let's see. Oh, so from well, it's actually I put I put down the location as my property, but it's actually like three steps onto the neighbor's property. Um, these I'm just calling them. Clitosophy in the broad sense. Uh, spores are white, not um, not reactive, not amyloid, not dextrinoid. Growing like in forest litter, leaf litter, twigs, stuff like that. Pretty late, you know. But some of these clitosophy mushrooms come up pretty late. So I don't know if these are clitosophy in the strict sense. Um, I don't even know. If I tried to look at anything at the gill, I should have. I think I probably did, but it, my microscope either what is not good enough to pick up the details, or there wasn't really anything very interesting. So I just wondered, you know, if anybody has an idea. Spores are small. A lot of these, a lot of these clytosby mushrooms have really small spores. Um, so I think these are. Yeah, actually, these are a little bigger than than some. These look like they probably are over seven microns. What I, I wrote down, I think, my estimate. Notice, Marcel, these spores look a little bit like your spores from um, from the thing you thought was a hygrophorus. Yeah, but I see the difference with the stem. There oh, this, well, this isn't this, this isn't the same species. No, yeah, yeah. no doubt. I mean, your thing was different. But yeah. the spores are a little bit similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just, it's interesting to find terrestrial gilled mushrooms at this time of the year. I mean, it's cold here now. This morning, it was, I don't know, 26 degrees or something um, on my front porch. Okay, I'm not sure. Oh, that looks like maybe the next one. So, oh, here we are, Rhodocolibia butteracea, the buttercap. I found these under white pine trees um, last uh, Sunday, or was it Saturday? Yes, yeah, Sunday, I think, we went for a walk at Francis Slocum State Park. And um, so these are very similar to Gymnopus Uh The stems are usually thicker. Um, the spore print is not quite white. It's, but you need to take the print on white and in, in order to see that it's a very, very pale, sort of a pinkish, or sometimes actually with some collections I made of these, it actually looks a little pale yellowish. Um, a lot of times the, the stems are kind of rooting, but you don't really see it on these. Um, but the last thing that you'll see here, oh, here's, some, here's something. See how the gills are really ragged? The edges are really ragged, they're like serrated. That's a, that's a feature associated with this species, Rhodocolibia butteracea. And they're very, very ragged. They, they, they get like that as they age. Um, the last thing we're gonna see though, I think really kind of, so this is the next to the last thing. You see on the white, you see the, there's a little bit of color there. It's a little bit pinkish there, that annular sort of region where the spores fell. So 
that's another thing. And then the last thing, and this is the most interesting thing about this observation. This is a big bunch of spores. So I took some of the spores that you just saw there and made a pile. So I had a whole bunch of spores and I put some melters on them. And do you see how some of them are purple? Some of them are and some of them aren't. And that is actually a feature associated with Rhodocolivia butyracea is that some of the spores are dextrin-like. And so this is also a good time to see, uh, to be able to observe what white dextrinite spores tend to look like. They, they turn purple. Now, you also read about spores of like Gymnopolis being dextrinite, and those spores start out being, being orange um, to begin with. And so, so the dextrinoid reaction looks a little different in spores that don't start out real pale. Um, Lepiotas and um, I think probably macro lepiota and, and all that stuff that used to be lepiota. Um, Leuco agaricus, all, all those things, Leuco coprinus, I think they all have dextrinite spores. So that's a trait associated with rhodoclibia buddy ratio is that some of the spores are dextrinite. Okay, so what do we have next? Interesting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Oh, so um, David Aurora calls this like the epitome of the boring LBM. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Tubaria furfuracea, which is probably a group of related species. These were on a lawn, probably growing from some buried woody debris. These are these are saprobes that grow usually on woody woody debris. You'll find them on wood chips sometimes. See how the one cap is a lot lighter than the other one? There's the tan one and then the white one. Um, this is because this species is hygrophonous, meaning as the um, context loses moisture, the cap context loses moisture, um, the surface um, fades to a very, very pale color. And um, so I don't know. I, I think these are not really all that boring. The, the thing that's most interesting to me about this species is you can find it in virtually any month of the year, even around here. I found them in February and March and January. Uh, the Chylocystidia tend to be just, sometimes they're thinner than these. These are a little thicker than I often see with Tubaria furfuracea. So, um, and I don't know what that thing is. It just, you know, it was there, so I took a picture of it. <laughs> it's some sort of septate hyphae um, or hypha, hypha. but kind of an in interesting species, I think, because they, they, they grow. I think maybe the only month I've never found this was July. But I, th I think I'd have to look through my records. I may have even found it in July, or at least one of the species in the group. OK, I guess there's one more thing here. Let's see. Uh, Brandon also had two more. Oh, OK, good. So. In my once again, three steps onto my neighbor's. Pro oh, actually, one of these was on my property, and the other one was three steps onto my neighbor's property. And I just put the, I just posed them together. This is Rhizomerasmius pyrocephala, a really little mushroom with a really big name. And um, this is another one. They come out really late, white spores, um, and they if. If it warms up a little bit, stays warm for a, for a given night, you know, let's, by, by warm, I mean, you know, maybe it stays 40 degrees or higher. Um, and usually it takes a little bit of rain to get these to come up, but boy, they just pop out in no time. So, and then they disappear in no time, kind of like Merasmius, because these used to be Merasmius. Maras Actually, I uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, a correction on that. Merasmias do not disappear really fast. They shrivel up and you don't see them. And then they rehydrate and you see them again. Now, I don't know, maybe these do that too. That's, that's, I hadn't considered that question really. Um, I'm not sure, but I think new ones come out every every time there's like a new rain event. Not sure about that though. They might shrivel up and hide, hide under the leaves. 
because they do tend to fruit in leaf litter. And they have a long, hairy uh, stipe that goes deeply into the substrate. Um, not so much deeply into the ground, but the long stipe is curved and and it's it, it will be winding its way around through the substrate, the leaves and, and twigs and stuff. A lot of times there's leaves and twigs stuck to the lower part of the stipe. And I should have um, I should have scoped some gill, but I had just two other things to look at because uh, these have pretty cool cystidia. They have tibioid cystidia, um, meaning on the, on the gills, meaning it's like a long, thin neck with a round head. And um, if I find another one, uh, it's supposed to warm up later this week. So I can probably find another one say, in, in my yard or the neighbor's property. And, Next time I'll get some cystidium. Okay, I guess that's, I, I actually, there was actually more stuff that, that I could have even put up, but that's enough. I, I went out today and found more things as well. So I've already got a start on next week. All right, cool. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank All you. right, Brandon, you want to close the show? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, just real quick on that last mushroom, Dave, that was Rhizomerasmius, was the genus? Yeah, Rhizomerasmius, R-H-I-Z-O, and then Merasmius. Gotcha. Cool. And P-Y-R-R, -R, I think there's two R's, like they need two R's there. Um, H, R-R-H-O. And then Cephalus, C E P H A L U S. Yeah, the little mushroom with a really big name. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's start with. So I think this is Xylobolus. Xylobolus. Yeah. Yeah. Frustratulus, I think it is, or something like that. Yeah. Frustulatus is what I had. Frutulat it oh, frutulat. Oh, oh, there's no S in there, I guess. Oh, I don't know. I could be wrong. I'm working off of a piece yeah, of paper. I'm probably wrong. I'm a little, bit, a little bit dyslexic. And I put letters where they aren't, and I take letters away where they are sometimes <laughs> in the middles of long words. It's not a good photo. Maybe that's a decent photo. Probably not too much you can confuse this one with, I would assume, right? Probably not. Maybe there might be a few lichens that are somewhat similar. Yeah, I came. But no, I think it. pretty much I, this is pretty distinctive and pretty common, I assume, as well. Yeah, it's a common fungus. I think it's usually on like oh, tree wood yeah. that the bark is falling off of, like, yeah. like you see here. Yeah, I think it's exclusively oak. Uh -huh. is, okay. These um Zyobolus have an interesting rot pattern to them too. If you can manage to break away a piece of that wood without breaking your knife, because the wood gets super, super hard, right. but it causes what they call a white pocket rot. So once you get in there, there's all these little teeny tiny pockets of white rot that are like just hundreds of hundreds of little teeny tiny holes all through the wood. It's really distinct oh, looking. Cool. Let's see. I'm going to have to try that now. Are there some, it's way within the wood, like those little kind of holes right above, kind of at the 12 o'clock? No, it's right under, it would be right underneath the fruiting bodies. Oh, okay. But, it, gotcha. but it's, not, it's not too deep into the wood. But usually that wood is like super, super hard. Maybe like right where this little one's missing, there's a little, little hole. You'll That's know so, you'll you'll know when you see it. It's a pretty distinct pattern. Okay, cool. And then I don't know how interested in calistoma people are. I think they're really neat looking. Yeah, they're 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 a wild one. Did you see that recently? Uh, I found this yeah last week, like Friday. They they tend to persist. For, for a while in situ. It's kind of dry out and but but the head 
Looks in good shape. Yeah, that one looks pretty fresh, though. Yeah, look at that. It's just lutescens, I guess. Is that the? So I had a yellow one too. I thought it was lutescens, um, but there was mention on lutescens of uh, what did they call it? Some kind of like slimy layer, and obviously that could have just faded at this point. Yeah, there is another yellow one. I forget. I, I, I Ravenelli somebody. Ravenelli, yeah, right. Yeah, so that was the other one that I was trying to compare it to. There is, you know what? I think if you go back to the picture, do you see the collar surrounding the bottom part of the cap? Yeah, I think that might be a distinguishing feature. I'm not sure. I don't find this species around here, but I just saw it not long ago when I was with uh, John and, and Nina and Igor in the Pine Barrens. Yeah, that was that was the first time that I had seen it was at that particular foray. So you're talking this photo. Or the one from the top, Dave. Yeah, well, here you can see it. See, there's like a collar um, uh, 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 surrounding the bottom part of the of the head. You see what I mean? Yeah. How it's like this, like triangles, like yep. sticking out, making like a collar. I think that might be a feature that that is useful in distinguishing these two. Because I remember John and or Nina and or Igor explained to me one of the differences. And um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I, I think it may have had something to do with that. Yeah, but that's that one. I think it's Lutessens, but. Nice photos. Cool, thanks. Thanks guys. Uh, uh, um, the Baroni book has a, has a good descri um, descriptions of the different ones. Yeah, that's what I was working off of. Um, and that's why I was almost thinking Ravenelli because that's the one that it mentions. Uh, it doesn't have like a, like a viscous layer. Yeah, but you know, you know that all that's probably dried up with the frost anyway. Yeah, that's what I that's what I was thinking because it mentions on um, lutescens that in the viscous layer it also contains kind of like white particles that mm -hmm. when that viscous layer dries are somewhat evident. And on this photo, you can kind of see just above the collar. There's that line of kind of white. I mean, it looks like sand, but it was attached to it, mm -hmm. kind of fixed to it. You know, you know what? I have the Baroni book open right now, and I'll read it. Uh, Calistoma lutescens is similarly gelatinous covered, but it produces a yellow spore sac with a bright red puckered mouth and has a distinct collar at the base of the spore sac after the gel has dropped off. Aha, there it is. Which which one's that for? Lutescens. Ah. Oh. Nice. All right, awesome. Good closure, Brandon. <laughs> Thanks. All right, well, that brings us up to nine o'clock, so. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight, for everyone who had stuff to share. And uh, hopefully we'll have another good mushrooming week and have another two hours of mushrooms to share next week. Awesome. Right. Thanks, Luke. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. All right. All right. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. See you next week. Thank you, guys. Yep. See you.